Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. Go right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Just stone go set so. If you're going to blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. Well, in the spirit of Stone Cold Steve Austin, what we saw the Texas Longhorns do on Saturday to Iowa State, they stomped a mud hole and then walked it dry. That game was not close. We thought it was going to be a tight back-and-forth game, and dreams of that ended early. Texas wins 24-10, and really the 10 Iowa State scored the touchdown was in garbage time. Uh, Texas dominates this game, guys, and we're going to talk about it on this week's edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns 24-7. I'm Jeff Howe. We will also get you ready for the great traditional Thanksgiving weekend rivalry game for Texas on the road against Kansas (laughs) at 11 a.m. on Friday. And uh, there's some stuff to unpack. We also got to unpack the Big 12 basically doing what the Big 12 does and Bob Bowlesby continuing, as Rod says, to be the Michael Scott of big of uh, conference commissioners. But we'll get to all that throughout this edition of the show. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, and you can find him on Thursday at a turkey fryer somewhere out in West Austin, Matt Butler. Matt, uh, how many how many fryers will the Butlers have going on Thanksgiving Day? It'll be a mixture. Uh, Pops already came and picked up mine at the house. <laughs> Uncle already called around to the family to make sure everybody brings them because we always bring enough just in case because, like, last year at, like, 7 a.m. had to drive home and pick one up because one burner wasn't turning on. But, yeah, normally have a rolling three of them going, probably two with oil and then one always heating up and stuff. I, and I love Matt's, Matt's family when they get together for Thanksgiving because Matt talks about how – you know, really, they just sit out there and kind of drink and, and fry turkeys and eat turkey all day. Oh, that's that's really what they do. And when I <laughs> usually roll up to get my turkey, they're just sitting out there drinking beer and frying turkeys and gnawing off of whichever one had just come out. So Yes, it's sort of the yeah. my dad and uncle's on the back porch, and then inside my mom and aunts are normally cooking like a breakfast quiche or something like there that. You go. Yeah, so. uh, I don't know if he enjoys quiche, but I know the third member of our team, our Lockdown Corner here on the show, he enjoys a good yard bird and uh, knows a good thing about a good yard bird. Uh, 2002 UT All-American, 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas, into 40 acres where he earned his degree. When he gets his T-ring in, he will wear it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And Rod, the Thanksgiving tradition of actually getting to eat a real meal on Thanksgiving is something you're still getting used to after your time on the 40 Acres, your time with the Detroit Lions. Yeah. Uh, Thanksgiving had been a work day. It is no longer a work day for you, so you actually get to enjoy Thanksgiving like the rest of the country. Yeah, even when they were trying to keep up the tradition after the Aggies left uh, mm-hmm. you know, the Big 12. TCU and Texas Still had to Tech. work on Thanksgiving. Yep. Yeah, so it's always been weird for me. Uh, I still get it mixed up. I was actually mm-hmm. recently you were in there yesterday when I was I was talking to uh, you know one of co one of the coworkers about the game and um, I kept re- referencing it like it was ha- it was happening on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. He was like, "What are you game. talking about?" I was like, "But the game." I was like, "When do I have to do it?" He's like, "No, no, no. The game is on Friday." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I keep forgetting." One so of those I'm so AMers. yeah, I'm just I'm just so trained almost like yep. you know what I mean to play on Thanksgiving even in the league when I was playing with the Detroit Lions we played on Thanksgiving all the time. So, so Rod, what are your big Thanksgiving plans? This year? Uh, well, I got I got my I got family in town. My mom's coming to town. My dad's coming to town. My girlfriend's mom is in town. Future mother in laws in town. Yeah, man. So it's big. My brother's gonna fry turkey, uh, and then hell, man, it's gonna be one of those modern day Thanksgivings. My mom's never met my girlfriend's mom, so it's gonna be 
strange and weird, and That's hopefully awesome. it's all good. <laughs> but if it ain't, I'm going to have plenty of tequila. So yeah. it don't matter. Holidays. Is, that's, yeah, that's, that's what it's all yeah, about. Yeah. Um, hey, real quick, just a piece of personal business, not for me, but a member of the Blitz family, and he's a big part, Rod, of your show, big part uh, of everybody, uh, everybody's show uh, at the Horn. Uh, CB. CB's been having CB. uh, yeah. some you know, family health issues with his dad, his grandma. Mm-hmm. I actually literally just saw a tweet from him. Uh, he got a call from his grandma, and she's being discharged from the hospital. Oh, so, that's good news. Way to go. So, CB, it's good to know everything's clearing up for you around the holidays. Yeah, uh, yeah CB's such a big help for us and, and, and all the all the shows. I mean, he's always tweeting us facts and stuff and making sure we're, we're staying up to date on stuff on Twitter. Best producer yeah, in the business. So, uh, and then best, like, Longhorn fan on the internet. Absolutely. Almost. Like, I've seen him, like, if you were to go and – Whole people worldwide. People know CB because he's the guy, the Texas guy. He's the guy no, that knows Dallas his stuff. Morning News did uh, people you should follow. Seriously, it was like, like the top ten, top ten most important like Texas Twitter, Twitter follows. He, he like made the list. Like, Congrats, CB. Among, like, Chris Del Conte. <laughs> well, like, I, I remember when Tom social Hart. media blew up and we were all like, who is CB's this? there. It's like, CB, yeah, well, yeah. Everybody's, you got a different name from, but uh, yeah, man, our thoughts and prayers with you, CB. Yeah, CB from all, yeah, everybody at the Horn, uh, obviously every, us here at the Blitz. Uh, glad to hear everything yeah. is going uh, going well for you during this holiday season. And it's also going good for the Texas Longhorns, guys. Like I said, a 24-10 went over Iowa State and Rod. I know you want to start with the defense. When I was with you on the broadcast on on Monday, a lot of it centered around the defense. And yeah. you know, I, I've as this game unfolded early, I felt watching this game the same way I felt watching the Notre Dame Syracuse game on TV. All I needed to watch was the first possession for each team to know how that thing was going to go, and it played out as expected. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, that's kind of how this game was. You watch the Texas defense from the start; it, it was a different defense than we've seen. And Matt and I were talking about this before the show. The offense, that's as good of an opening drive from the Texas offense as you'll ever see. Nine plays, 80 yards, and a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Rod, this thing was over pretty quick. Uh, well, honestly, it was, it was pretty much over before it actually really got started. The truth is this this is the best defensive performance for an entire game, all four quarters, that we've seen probably this entire year. you got to go back to last year. The bowl game last year probably, yeah. Yeah, a better performance. We're talking about all four quarters. We all can – Remember that quarter or that half where the Texas defense collapsed. Had a great Oklahoma game, fourth quarter collapse. Had a great game overall versus, um, I would say USC, but the first quarter was a little weird. Tulsa, fourth quarter. Baylor, fourth quarter, things like that. So, so yeah, it, K-State is another one. I mean, we can go on and on. I think all Lohan fans know that defensively that's really been a theme, an unfortunate theme this game. Uh, Todd Orlando, he kind of went back to the not only being the more physical defense, and he stated that in the week before, right? He wanted to have padded practices because they were getting they were getting gashed. They had given I think they had sixty missed tackles in the previous three games before Iowa State that I had tracked. It's just me personally. Correct if I'm wrong, Rod. Weren't you tracking tackles in the West Virginia game and you just stopped at some point because it's just uh, he resumed? Well, no, I went back and actually <laughs> okay, did it all the way through. Initially, I did because I was I disgusted. Saw Rod, and he was um, literally yeah. Tack- Piling up missed yeah. tackles, um, and I counted sixty. It was actually, it was actually, uh, I think, twenty four in the uh, Oklahoma State game, seventeen in the West Virginia game, and seventeen Jeez. in the Tech game, if you want to be exact. Uh, but in this game, there were only eight that I counted. So I think number one, you know, th- it helped that they were physical and they were tackling well. I don't know if the scheme helped them being better positioned to tackle, or if the tackling made the scheme more effective. Like, uh, you know, they sort of worked together, the though. Kind of thing. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? But I do believe Todd Orlando, it, it, this was the most aggressive game plan that maybe he's had all year long. Even P.J. Yeah. Lockett admitted, he said, hey, man, we blitzed way more than we normally blitz in this game. Hell, man, they blitzed. I got to go back and look at the percentage of plays that they actually brought five guys. I'm going to go do that and track that next time. But it's, it's I'm probably say, in the 80s, Rod. Right? I mean, dude, it's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And hell, I saw Caden Stearns blitz. And you never see Caden Stearns blitz. He was playing middle fielder early in the year. They had him blitzing. They actually had B.J. Foster and Caden Stearns playing roles that seemed to me like they were interchangeable, although maybe not uh, classified in terms of their position as a nickel or a dime. Right. But they were utilized with, in terms of versatility Both in a of lot them played of different in the ways. box. Both of them played, played over the, the top. Bo- yeah. I saw, I saw uh, Caden Stearns covering Hakeem Butler in the slot. I saw him blitzing. I saw him playing a whole player. Sometimes he was a spy. I mean, they had him all over the place. And what did he get? Three tackles for loss. Of course. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's a great player. You just got to put him in a position to be successful. You put him as a middle fielder. Well, hell, people are going to start staying away from or scheming to uh, exploit him there. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think he just mixed up the tendencies, man. That it did. Gary Johnson and Anthony Willard were moving around. Malcolm Rose playing D tackle. Malcolm Rose playing D in. Uh, Charles Menhu playing D tackle. Charles Menhu playing D in. Sometimes he had two guys with their hands in the dirt. Sometimes it was three. Uh, you know what I mean? Like sometimes he went with a four man front. Hell, that was even times I saw him with a five man front and forty personnel. It was just all over the place. It made them so unpredictable. It was one of the best called games by Tart Orlando that I've seen since he's been here. No, yeah, no question. The, you brought up the pressure, and you'd look at just havoc plays created by the defense. And in context, like I remember West Virginia, everybody wanted, and even the coaches said that they wish they could have got more pressure. There's only six havoc plays. This one, 13 havoc plays from the end. You see a lot from DBs. There was a couple from Stearns, like you said, and you have your normal ones from guys like, say, Devontae Davis. But across the board, to be able to have, it, it looks like, Ten players had Havoc plays to where you had ten that. different guys yeah. at least put pressure, and you can see what happens when you bring some pressure. And we heard uh, Tom Herman talk about the situation and hoping to just get into the passing downs and how much easier it makes things for the secondary. And we've been talking about this on the show all season long. And if you look at Purdy again, this week under four yards per attempt, 3.87 yards per attempt on passing downs. With overall 6 of 13 for 68 yards, a pick, and two sacks. So not not only do you hold them to the 3.8 per attempt, also you're getting home on passing yeah. downs, which shows how good your pass rush the is. The most sacks I believe Iowa State's allowed in two in, since 2016, actually Ooh. against Texas. And, and I'll say this too: he was multiple, not only in philosophy and ideology, but also in formations and also with his personnel, moving different guys it around. It was a hybrid. So to me, that's how you want to attack modern offenses. you got to be as multiple as they are. So that's what I'll give him credit for. And I, I thought it was a great game plan. So kudos to him. I will say this. It wasn't an air raid DNA, though. True. Uh, and the, the the offenses that have wrecked Todd Orlando and mm-hmm. wrecked every DC in this conference and in the world. have come from the air raid DNA. It's Cliff Kingsbury, it's Dana Hogerson, it's Lincoln Riley. You know what I mean? Like those are the offenses he's had trouble with. And when you're playing the Big Twelve title game, hopefully that's the case. Not looking ahead, that's what you're gonna have to deal with. It's gonna yep. be Hogerson. It's gonna be one of the other Lincoln yeah. Riley. It's gonna be that air raid DNA. So ultimately, you cannot avoid the truth. You got to figure out the air raid DNA. You got to solve what right now NFL defenses yes. can't figure out. Right. You just see those two air raid <laughs> quarterbacks last night score more points. I was saying Charlie <laughs> Strong was looking at the TV. See, it's hard to stop, man. First time we've seen two teams score fifty points. A team score fifty points and lose in the NFL. Jared Goff air raid. Patrick Mahomes air raid. Andy Reid recently said he says Cliff Kingsbury is a genius. He's one of the greatest offensive minds he's ever been around. This is Andy Reid now yeah. talking about Cliff Kingsbury, yeah. right? So that's the first air raid, maybe the way we talk gets, spring. When babies. he gets fired over there at Texas Tech, y'all want to fire him? You know what, Texas? Y'all should hire him. If y'all don't hire him, somebody in the NFL is going to hire him. Because I think that's where his next stop is. A year ago, this week. Off. And you know what, Dallas Cowboys? It wouldn't be crazy. It, I'm telling you, it wouldn't be crazy Jason, if Jason Garrett keeps his job for him to fire Scott Linehan. And bring on Cliff Kings. Last year it wouldn't be crazy at all. Remember last year, wouldn't this exact week, Thanksgiving week, all Texas fans were hoping Kingsbury would get fired yeah. so he could come be a type <laughs> no, of not everybody. Rod B said that yeah. first, and everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Well, I remember yeah. that. I remember I we were young. I was like, no, I want you to beat him so bad they fire him right there and then go offer him a contract right there on the spot. Tom Harmon, go say when you go in the, the, the post game handshake, go, hey brother. As soon as they do, I'll make you the highest paid. I, I've got I'll it make on, you the highest paid coordinator in the country. I've got it on pretty yes, good right authority. Now. I've got it on pretty yes. good authority. That's what Tom Herman was planning on doing. <laughs> <laughs> like if they won, the well, Texas wins sense. that game and Cliff Kingsbury gets fired. Yeah, because we forget the the Texas offense. Like it's it's so just fascinating to look at how good they've been this year and think about just how awful they were last year. That Tom Herman felt like that was going to be the shot in the arm to bring Cliff Kingsbury in. Now. They're doing it without Cliff Kingsbury. But, yeah, to your point, Rod, I, I do think the NFL is probably going to be Cliff Kingsbury's next stop I, I, because that's where the league is going. But Lincoln Rowdy, too. But getting back to Iowa State, and, and you're right, Iowa State is more, I hate to say, conventional because Matt Campbell does have spread principles in his offense. He's really a pro, a pro spread, power spread He's what guy. Tom Harmon right. uh, wants to be but philosophically. I like the fact, and you broke it down uh, excellent, Rod, excellently, Rod, and just mentioning you know, being multiple and you, you see your personnel. And, look, we, we know this defense has personnel issues. Like, that, those aren't those aren't things that you fix, right? Those aren't th- like I said. Unless you're Alabama or Clemson, everybody's got everybody's defensive. got some three or four holes on that defense. Right. Like, damn. I so fix it. Yeah. when you start looking at this Texas defense, though, my thing going into this game in the last few weeks was, you know, if you're gonna go down, go down swinging with your best punch. Like, do what you do, be who you are. 
And I think this win, especially on defense, it was a culture win as much as anything else. And you mentioned going back to the padded practices and going back to tackling to the ground. I think this is Todd Orlando saying, look, if we're going to get beat, I'm going to get beat being who I am and doing what we do, and that's being physical, aggressive. that's being aggressive, and bringing pressure and the ways they brought pressure, Rod. They're bringing hey. boundary blitzes, yeah. field blitzes, corner blitzes, safety, safety blitzes, blitzes, nickels, linebackers, linebackers yeah, slanting crazy. on the defensive line. Yeah. I mean, that was that's what we've come to expect from a Todd Orlando a bra- defense. Well, remember when Clay Hilton called him the master of the art of confusion? Yeah. In that game? He lived up to that title. Like he, it was the. I, I remember there's a there's a dime package that they're using now, and they use the lightning, um, and they didn't use the lightning as much. They stayed, stayed in that three three five a lot of the yeah. time. But when they got him in uh, predictable passing situations, they'd play that dime and they put Malcolm Roach at the D tackle, and they'd put a Minahu wide. They were the only guys whose hands were in the dirt, and then they would put like Gary Johnson in the in the B gap, and they'd line like Anthony Will in the B gap and Jeffrey McCulloch. Or remember Joseph Asai got that Asai. strip sack. That, they were they were in that yep. formation. He was just the other guy on the stand up rush in, and sometimes it could be Hager or whatever. But then they would line the linebackers up in what I, I, it's been referred to, and I don't know other references for it and other terminology for it. But we call it a ghost front, where you never mm-hmm. know where they're coming from. They're yeah. ghosts essentially. They could splits or they could drop back, so they're just standing up there. And dude, Brock Purdy, and you treated him like a true freshman. Make him process as much information as possible. Make him. Dude, you think about what this true freshman was dealing with. Thurl. Calculating. You think about a hundred something thousand people, and we all admit that was one of the best home field environments we've ever seen. You ever I, see these season? I'll, I'll like, say it was. was I'll say was it was lit. the best. I'll say it was the best. You know what I mean? Like it was up there, man. Yeah. I got it, you get chills like thinking about it. it was awesome, and, and that he's dealing with that. So biggest crowd he played in front of, and think about all of the things that Tarlando was throwing at him. So he's got. Now Malcolm Rose playing D tackle and Charles Amina who's wide, so he's worried about that. But then you got Anthony Wheeler and Jeffrey McCullough coming from different angles. He's got the safeties like creeping up and BJ Foster on the outside. Hell, if you're a true freshman, you're like, this is not what I saw. Not what you mm-hmm. told. Is it not what I saw on film? This is not. This is not what I saw. These guys Unfair. are moving around all over the damn place. I have no idea who's going where or what they're doing. And that's what exactly what they look like. Like he he couldn't figure. Out. Only thing he could figure out was Hakeem Butler is open one on one. That's just. You know what I mean? Like, this is the only thing they knew. Because every to, to blitz that much, you're going to have to leave a couple of guys one-on-one in certain situations. That was the only thing he knew at certain times that he could diagnose with precision was Hakeem Butler one-on-one with Devontae Davis, one-on-one with Chris Boyd. I'm chunking it up. And, you know, Hakeem Butler won his fair share, but he didn't get a touchdown, and they didn't get a lot of yards after the catch. And, you know, and that's the guy that was averaging, what, 23 yards per catch? 22.7, yep. So I think, honestly, if that's what you give up, because you got to give up something, you know what I mean? Like, you can't stop everything. That's pretty good to give up. And he knew David Montgomery was not in that game early, so it's like they can't move the chains. If I can just get them behind the chains, they are so screwed. Yeah, and, and then get a lead until he yeah. comes back in and make him be least effective just because the game script is yeah. your head and make them throw, and it's whenever you've been successful. And you brought it up there, the idea that you look at the havoc that I mentioned, Aminahu, fewest on the team of anybody yeah. that registered, uh, half of one, but then you had two from Stearns, two from Boyd, had another one from Foster, one from Locke, one from Davis, and Devontae Davis. Davis had sort of been the guy that you could predict that would be the guy coming in previous weeks, and it was just cool yeah. to see. Like you said, it was sort of how we talked about uh, the idea that you can be comfortable in the chaos, and every coordinator exactly right. has this odd situation where yeah. it's a one-game sample, just like these random football games that we're all playing, and you might find one on a good day or a bad day, but how it can go in the right direction or the wrong direction. And yeah. if you stay one step ahead, it allows the defense, or, or the offense in this case, to become defensive because the Reacting to what the exactly defense right. says. That you know what? That's I don't think anybody's put it in a better, more articulate way than that. Because you're right. Essentially, w- offenses are now blitzing the defense, right? Yes. That's what the pre-snap motion, the funk is all about. That's what That's the, the offense is everything. trying to do the, to you. They're to minus change you. splits. They're basically trying to identify, blitz you, yeah. right? As, a, as an offense, so they're trying to dictate the tempo now. As a defense, you got to be the one that kind of, that forces them to become. Uh, like they're they're take what like you give heels, like and you, you fall back yeah. to something like, like they got to start diagnosing. Well, what, what are they doing? Like, yes. I don't know what they're doing. Like I don't know what is happening. Like and, you know, I mean, which negates whatever advantage you're trying to get schematically by your pre-snap motion shifts and all that kind and of stuff. And if Texas gets that all becomes, the time, Texas match, will win because Texas normally yeah. has better players, and Texas has been literally putting these players in better yeah. position. We haven't seen as many results, but this year is a lot better than last year. So if you, you stack know, these together, it's good. You know who was the who was actually on the forefront of this? They just 
there wasn't enough patience of the Texas fan base and there wasn't enough <laughs> job security. Manny Diaz. Yeah. Yep. Manny Diaz. Was, oh, yeah. that was it. Remember, that was Manny Diaz's big thing. His was crazy defense. Crazy, like cra- <laughs> chaotic stuff and have the, the quarterback like for a second go, what the hell am I looking at? And then by the time he figures it out, he's sacked. When we grow and up in this era of the zone he, blitz, watching it. I think what happened to him, he was, just, he was just in the Big 12 and there was enough job security at that time. The Texas, you know, the Texas And he was facing the best coaches place. if, say, he was he on was the East Coast Art facing Browse somebody. All, all they're like, yeah, we, can, we find a few holes we can actually yeah. pick at those. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad you brought up Manny Diaz. That's the, but we know Manny Diaz is awesome. That's one the best DCs in the country. And that's one thing I wanted to touch on with this game. And, and we talked about this last week. And the one thing I felt like Todd Orlando had going for him that Manny Diaz didn't at the end, Advanced Bedford didn't at the end. At some point, the players lost faith in the plan and the in message the from the defensive coordinator. Yeah. And once Rod, you bit, you played for the Detroit Lions. Yeah. And once the once the players lose faith, man, you're screwed as a head coach. Yeah. Once they don't believe in the play call that you yeah. can even execute it. Yeah. You, it, they basically it's a it's a it's a it's a lose lose situation. Because right. no matter what the call, we're going to fail here. Yeah, right. I agree. And, again, not to slight your NFL career, Rod, with the no, Lions. No, no, no. But, I, know, but the guys give up on the system yeah, all the time. Exactly. And that's when our coach is going to get fired. And <laughs> I never felt like even in the Texas Tech game, the message from the players, and look, take post-game press conference quotes and sound bites for whatever you want to, but you talk to oh, guys like sure. Charles Amenahu, you talk to guys like Devontae Davis, and they really believed in Todd Orlando's message of, Look, man, just keep swinging. If you bust your tail and get to the football and you play with good effort, man, at some point something good's going to happen. And we talked about, like, the game plan against Texas Tech through the middle portions is almost like, look, if you just stick with it at some point, Jet Duffy's going to do something to screw this up. And mm-hmm. when he does, make sure you're there to capitalize. Exactly right. And that's how you get three red zone turnovers. Mm-hmm. And so I say that to say this, the game plan, Rod, that was a defense that was confident in this game plan, and it was almost like they were excited, like they were chomping at the bit to go execute. Because I can't tell you at any point this year when I've seen blitzes executed and timed as well as they were on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, some guys, I think B.J. Foster just has a natural knack for it, but you're right. That, like, that was one of the problems before. They were, and I can't call them lazy, but they they, had the, they weren't timed very accurately. The, the best Not time, and I know precision. there were there were other good blitzes, but the one that sticks out in my mind, there was a play early in that game where Chris Boyd blitzes from the short side of the field, and it's like he, I don't, if you're, that's a cut up you want on a coaching film, mm. because you can't coach a corner blitz better than that. Yeah. Like the way you stay in coverage until the last minute and then boom, you sell it. it I there's just I can't describe like how in awe I was like oh my god that was one of the cleanest corner blitzes I've ever seen at any level of football yeah and no, then I mean, add on the psychological impact that it then has on a true freshman quarterback seeing things and then seeing it actually impact him and then now the rest of the game you're gonna be wondering where's it coming from this time yeah, and I wonder yeah because I I'd say I didn't see a lot of I gotta go back and look like zone blitz schemes where they drop D linemen. Like they had been doing, um, I'll talk like about many we're seeing very right? Many. I didn't see many, so I, I mean, so there were a lot of things. They were subtle, but man, they were. Uh, it was it was so impactful. A lot of the things that ended up having for Texas, like you talk about the time blitzes being one. The other thing, and and I think part of the reason why Todd Orlando was aggressive early, Rod, you said it well, getting them behind the chains because without David Montgomery, one of your best playmakers on the field, you had no shot in third and long. Yeah, it wasn't the fear. I factor. think. I think part of that, and I wonder if part of that was Todd Orlando thinking, look, kind of like we talked about, by the time David Montgomery gets in the game, you need to get it to a point to where his impact has to be maximized in other ways other than just being able to turn around and hand him the ball. Yeah. Because if that's the case, then you didn't take advantage of his absence. And you can see he's a damn good player. When he comes oh, in, yeah. like, that was a difference. Yeah. A noticeable difference. But the game was at a point where you had to throw the football. Yeah, like you're down, what was 17-3 at halftime? And you're and you're in a hole, and, and Texas yeah. got the ball to start the second half. Like, yeah, you you you. Then the clock's against you at that point. You can't just turn around and hand him the ball. Yeah. So that couldn't have worked out any better than it did for Texas. No, I totally agree. And I, I mean, that's taking advantage of the fact that no David Montgomery. I think Todd Orlando at that point said, you know what, we're going to be the aggressor without without having to worry about that guy. I don't have to worry about you know the modus operandi we talk about. You know, we got to take away the run. Make them one dimensional. All right, that's the first step. Second step, put pressure on the quarterback. Third step, force turnovers. You don't have to really worry about number one. Navy Montgomery was already out, so they their running game, unless they, they tried to use Brock Purdy, I think to supplement that, but that's not enough. And Todd Orlando knew, like, well, I just got to pressure the quarterback then. I ain't got to worry about step number one in my right. MO. I just got to go get after Purdy. And that started that from the jump. 
that set the tone. And then for and then even you know the run blitzes. I mean they were they were blitzing on standard rundowns. Yeah, no, no, no. We get we're resetting the line of scrimmage. We're getting in the backfield, and we know this other guy. We know David Montgomery is is real skilled. All right, we know he can break tackles probably as well as any running back in the country. But he ain't playing. So this other guy, we're gonna see if he's that damn good, and if he can avoid the chaos and be redirected, and also still be able to make yards. And you know what? He couldn't. Rod, he did it once or twice. Rod, once I want you to go kind of next level here and break down this from an X's and O's standpoint. Uh, we talked about using different guys as a spy. Like sometimes Gary Johnson mm-hmm. was a spy. B.J. Foster was a spy. At sometimes so Kate Kate Stearns. Stearns was a spy. Yeah. Uh, I just want your thoughts on the spy concept, how it works, how it doesn't work, and also blitzing on rundowns because that's something that we don't talk about a lot. But yeah. it seemed like they were they were bringing pressure on rundowns a yep. lot more than we've seen Texas do the last few weeks. It makes sense, especially if you're having trouble stopping the run. Um, that you know what, instead of us being on our heels in Texas, right, what were te- people attacking Texas with the uh, the outside zone? You know, what I mean, that's what they were doing, trying to get to the I mean, edges. That was really it, pretty much. It was just pretty a much wide it. Yeah, stretch, you know, yeah. I mean, then stretch, whatever you want to call it. And then Texas, they had to go east and west. The, the defensive line, instead of penetrating, going north and south, they had to go east and west. Well, you know what? Let's eliminate that altogether. Let's just shoot gaps. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Let's have guys shoot gaps. And once they shoot gaps, and then we can let the then we can let our linebackers because then you can you kind of nullify the offensive lineman being able to get to the second level with our linebackers flow. And then we'll add guys from the secondary to the run defense too, and then we'll just let speed flow to the football. So I actually like blitzing on rundowns. I, I think it's something that Todd Orlando should do more of because in the Big 12, I mean, I think everybody's trying to get to the perimeter, especially on Texas. You know, you don't want your lineman running east and west. Try to get your lineman running straight ahead and penetrating. And we don't have a Puna forward, you know what I mean? Then, you know what, let's just get guys who can penetrate, like Malcolm Roach playing more at D-tackle. Uh, let's get, you know, let's just get get run blitzes. You know, let's get guys linebackers shooting gaps, which they did in the blitz game. So I think that's that's just it, make, it just and that's, to, it'd be the aggressor. Yeah. Don't allow the don't allow mm-hmm. the offense to put you on your heels. It's just the Become same Become offensive. Example. That's yeah. the that's the frustrating thing because that's what we talked about in the off season that yeah. this defense was going to need to be because you no longer had Puna Ford. You no longer had yeah. just that hellacious beast of a three down nose tackle, which you need to run a three man front. I mean that's. Really, where it all starts, it's Puna Ford, it's Casey Hampton, it's Ed yeah. Oliver. It's a guy that can you really occupy guy. four gaps on, on any given down. No, you don't have that guy. Yeah, but but so, you have other pieces where exactly. you can be effective. Be you just have to do it in a different, in a different exactly. Way. And and to the whole player thing or the spy, I you got usually take that guy from the secondary. The only risk is you're gonna leave your corner. Somebody you're gonna have guys that are gonna be on islands with wide receivers at that point. But when you had Brock Purdy and they were trying to make Brock Purdy the focal point of their running game, and they were I think he got like two of two rushing first downs on Texas, I want to say, just running the football early on. I got to go back and look at it. But they, you can tell, like, hey, nothing's open. He was going to run it. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that was just a smart move. Just gives him one more thing to watch. Uh, and once he looks at that and has to identify the guy's a whole player, that keeps him from running or he's going to hold the ball a little bit more, your blitzes can get home. So I think it's just a, it, it was just one more added element to try to discombobulate Brock Purdy. I mean, and that's, just be multiple. He, yeah. he didn't do it every time, and he did it with different guys. Yeah. So if he did it every time with Gary Johnson, then it's go, Brock Purdy goes, okay, I know. Gary Johnson's right there. That means he's vacating this to do it. Um, that means I can probably have a hole over here, or I can look to drop it off to this guy. No, it was a different guy every time, which means, oh, oh crap, Gary Johnson's still there, but this time – I think it's Caden Stearns who's the whole player. So now I got to look around. I got to go to another read, and that's all. That's all it is, man. It's a chess match. Yep. You want to make him uh, have to process more information, and the only way to do that is to change it up as much as possible. What they say about playing the all-time greats like Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady, they don't. Nobody can defend him. Nobody can defend Drew Brees. But what mm-hmm. do you do? We're just gonna throw as much crap at him as we can, and hope we're gonna pray to God that he makes a mistake or makes a wrong read or holds the ball too long. Look at NFL last night. All the defensive scores that changed the game and at the end, the interception yeah. that came up because otherwise it was going to be another Tyree kill yeah, touchdown. Yeah. And, and I, I think – Yeah, so it, it ain't yeah, it ain't rocket science. No, and, then, and that's – again, I go back to it. That's the frustrating thing with Todd Orlando and, and this defense and the struggles they've been having because even in the preseason when you talk to guys like Cliff Kingsbury and Lincoln Riley about what's tough to – Move the what makes moving the ball against the Todd Orlando defense tough. It's the same things we talked about. And I mean, he's Cliff, the master Cliff, of the art of confusion. Cliff Kingsbury told me he said you've got to help your quarterback, especially early, process what he's seeing because if not, he's going to start seeing ghosts and then you're in trouble. Yeah, it's, it, what, and, and we've heard that from um, Sam Darnold said that. Yeah, right. Last year he said the same thing, and I think 
And for some reason, Todd Orlando got a little bit more conservative. I don't, really don't know why. Oh, man, like go down swinging. That's what you do. And yeah, the you last know, two it, weeks, yeah, you've okay. had uh, in standard downs because you're talking about in standard downs and being effective in bringing them. Three sacks against Tech on standard downs. Two stacks this past week on standard downs, and that's huge. Look at the four weeks combined all the way back to the Oklahoma game. It was 0-1-0-1. So he had two sacks combined on standard downs yeah. the previous four games. Then you end up having two and three. You've had five in the last two games. If you look back, we were talking earlier, what other great defensive performances you can maybe have seen from Texas? you got to go all the way back to the K-State game where, you know, numerically they grade out about the same, and that was the last time Texas had multiple multiple sacks on standard downs, had two in the K-State game. Then we saw a lot of offense really mess with Texas for four yeah. weeks, only had two in four games, and then now you've had five the last two, and that's big if you can get that on standard downs. To, to Matt's yeah. point, if you start looking at the S&P Plus numbers, the defensive performance in that K-State game was in the 92nd percentile nationally against Iowa State in the 91st percentile. Yeah. And really, in the last three weeks, Oklahoma State, 18th percentile, West Virginia 10, Texas Tech 10. Yeah. So and that's you went, adjusted literally, for Literally, in a three-week stretch, you went from being one of the worst defenses in the country to being one of the best. Also, not air raid. That's yeah. the only – That's all yeah, it is. Like, I, I, it, it, it's just that guy that keeps bringing this up. But no, it's, no, it's only know, accurate. Like, uh, it's, they're not air raid. Yeah, you can't man, sugarcoat like that. You can't sugarcoat that. But I'm not – I don't want to, you know, I don't want to diss the – the great improvements that they've made. I don't want to be that guy, but yes, yeah, it's true. And it's, it's because in the air raid, it's harder to bring pressure or maybe to be confident in bringing well, pressure. Well, no, it is because you got the Point crossing being. routes happening. So, but that's why really we're quick, seeing like the running back that's you know with that play that West occupying loves to more run, people. That running back, he just basically just runs like a a, a, a spear route, like a sprint route, mm-hmm. right out of the backfield. They just toss it to him right. I over. mean, look what yeah. Maryland and did it, though. Maryland did the same it? thing with the jet sweep motion to dislocate oh, yeah. the defense. And then you look across the board though. There's a certain elements that can take away numbers from the defense. Yeah. That then the defensive coordinator becomes limited at his options of what he can bring, and that just comes down to good coaching yeah. on both. Things. That's the fun chess match. Did you like get to watch that Maryland Ohio State game? Man, yes, I'm it was the, that was maybe right the it. nuttiest game I've ever yeah. seen. But I, that I, was out of this. I world. chose that over over Baylor TCU, which was bowling shoe ugly. It was terrible. Oh, oh at the same yeah. time, it was oh. like there was a three to oh. nothing oh. Michigan <laughs> State Nebraska or something, and on the other channel, it was Maryland Ohio State. Urban Meyer. I yeah, really I'm, watching it. I thought I was like, <laughs> hey, the dude's gonna have to I'm step watching down a, after the game. He's I'm watching a Big Twelve. I'm watching a Big Twelve game between Baylor and TCU. That's like a nine six game the whole way. And then I'm watching a Big Ten game where Maryland puts like 35 on Ohio State in the first half. Hey, man. Matt Canada, he's got a lot of principles and concepts that he shares with like Big 12 air raid teams and spread teams. Little baby booger balling. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I see, man, looking at Kansas, if I'm Les Miles and he's available, (laughs) Matt Canada might be my call for offensive coordinator. Damn, that's Canada's going to want a head coaching job, but yeah, he. Uh, that's a damn good call. I don't he know if he's going to move job. That. Yeah, I, if he would take that job. And that's wouldn't, and wouldn't that wouldn't that be something if Matt Canada, who was fired at LSU by Ed Orgeron, who hired him, and then Les yeah. goes from LSU to Kansas that's and then brilliant. brings Matt Canada with him? That is brilliant. It's it a would coaching blow my circle mind of life, man. Did. That is brilliant, man. But let's. Uh, we're talking about offense. Let's talk about the Texas offense, and uh, you know, really, Rod, just from the jump. I mean, they were efficient. Uh, they scored in the first drive, but the drive I want to talk about, and I talked about this being a culture win. Mm-hmm. They go 94 yards in 10 plays, and they have a third and six. That's a 20 yard completion to Lil Jordan Humphrey, and it's complete beyond the sticks. But he pushes the pile, and then the fact that you get Calvin Anderson, Elijah Rodriguez, and Zach Shackelford all going and pushing the pile with him to get him extra yards. Very similar to this tunnel screen on third and long we saw in the Oklahoma game that really kind of changed the complexion of that game. I just thought, you know, both sides of the ball, man, this was Texas just getting back to, okay, who are we? And and Tom Herman mentioned it because I asked him about it again on Monday in his press conference, and he said, you know, playing Iowa State, who they feel they respect Matt Campbell, they know Iowa State preaches a physical brand. Again, it's very similar to the the philosophy Texas has. They knew they were going to have to be physical. And, Rod, that's why I think if you're a Texas fan, you feel so good about this win, not just because you beat a ranked team, not just because you beat a ranked team by a comfortable margin, but the way that game unfolded, it's like you gave Iowa State no shot because – you hit him in the mouth, and you just kept hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting until you eventually just knocked him out at the end of the game. Yeah, um, and you know it's 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 strange. We've talked about this before that that's Tom Herman's brand of football is that he wants to be the more physical team. 
against Oklahoma. That's where Texas had their significant advantage. You know, I mean, like they, they you, you can't say they were the more skilled team. But even Tom Herman admitted this week, right? He said he called Texas overachievers. Like, no, we're overachievers for the most part. You know what I mean? Like, we're not going to have a lot of all Big 12. I think they will have some all Big 12 uh, selections. But so, no, we're not going to have a lot of first team all Big 12 selections. I think what he means by that is, we don't win necessarily because we are better at every position just yet, you know what I mean, than, than our opponent. Yeah. There's still some places where Iowa State, probably man-for-man, has better man-to-man matchups against Texas, which should never actually be the case. Right. But what he's saying is, like you're saying, it's a, it's, we're doing it with culture now. Uh, we're imposing our will on teams. I, I go, going into that game, you could argue Iowa State was a better team than Texas. Yeah. I mean, I'm just talking about as a team. In terms mm-hmm. of they had a better defense. Brock Purdy was playing really, really well. I mean, they one through eighty-five and how they're performing. Yeah, like you could. They were on a five-game win streak. You could argue they were a better team. Not saying they had more talent, right. but they were a better team than Texas. In that in that game, Texas not only was a better team, but they were more physical. And we've been at least bragging about Matt Campbell that you know that's how Iowa State wins because they don't have a lot of talent, right? They win because it's, they're like K State was back in the day. They're hard nosed. Even the players, Charles and who was saying it last week, he's like, "Nah, man, they're coming in here. They're just gonna try to punk us, man. They that's the way they play ball and they go back to the huddle and they take care of business." And I think Texas was ready to meet that standard of physicality. It's almost like, and that's why you know Texas is taking a step forward. You know, that Texas-Oklahoma game, you've talked about it. Well, you, you call it a line of scrimmage game. Yep. I call it the State Fair Street Fight. It's a game where you got to understand it's going to be physical. Like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of pain. It's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, just a lot of fighting. It's going to be a lot of physicality, and you got to match it, and you got to overcome it, and you have to beat it. You will get punched in the mouth. Play to the echo of the whistle. Yeah, like, you're going to get yeah. punched in the mouth. Like, you got to expect it, and then you got to come back even hungrier, and you got to come back even harder. That's what the Texas OU game is all about. And Iowa State presented to me a kind of a challenge very similar, and Texas met that challenge and overcame it. So that's a it's another step in the right direction, man. It, the program, it ain't Texas ain't back, but yeah. damn, they're on the right track. And that's a good point right there because you know if you look at all these things aligning that we're talking about, first off, like the players going out and being highly efficient and performing well in their duties, but the coach is also putting them in the right spot. And we used to talk about how you would see these other teams play up to yep. the situation and be able to play up. Well, right now, you know, if you look at Texas overall. Coaches get fired because Texas always has players. You're Texas. You're always going to get players. Yeah. So if you can get all those other things that we're talking about right now, the few things that lift lesser opponents, or then you combine scheme, then you combine, like, say, the players uh, playing for one another, and you just add up all these elements that you maybe had seen one lacking here one year, one lacking here one year, and you get these things that you used to seeing your opponents bring to you, and then now you know we've always had the better players if you put it on paper but the game's not on paper and once you start to stack these up you can see that the upside can be there and those are sort of the signs that you know we look at the record and you can say yeah it's an expected growth and a good growth but when you start to stack that on top of oh these are all the things they were deficient in that now they're performing yeah. at expectation and these players are young that's where you can continue to have that exponential growth once you get the right pieces into the pie. To your point Matt I'll point out two examples the one that shows you where Texas was and one that shows Shows you a similar trajectory Texas is on. Florida and USC. Like both those schools are similar to Texas. And oh, yeah. You should always have it's USC, you should always have players. Yeah. It's the University of Florida, you should always have players. But now you're seeing Dan Mullen take talent that Jim McElwain couldn't win games with, and now they're you know, I watched their South Carolina game. I mean, I think they've got a chance to go win. What are they? Nine wins right now? Yeah, eight wins right now. Doing well. They if were they beat Florida good. State, I think they'll be nine and three, and they got a chance to go get them ten wins yeah. with a bowl game. And you're seeing the opposite at USC, where Texas was. Which we saw that team here in Austin in September. Like USC has talent. They do. Have yeah. Like they've got. Are they as talented as some of those Pete Carroll teams? Absolutely not. No, but got it's USC. They've got talent. There, there's no reason USC should be a seven loss team. And Agreed. just lost which they will a lesser be. team with better scheme with Chip Kelly. Like, Chip Kelly's a punchline, but he's a good coach, and he's a guy yeah. that come in and can elevate. He can say, oh, I have these pieces. It's like, I can be a bit of a formula guy, but I got my scheme, and once you tell me what I have, I'll make it work. Which SC's going to be a seven loss team once Notre Dame bashes their head in yeah, or when they play. Be a, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, and that's probably why Clay Helm's going to get fired because it's about more than just having talent in schemes. It's you've got to have a culture of toughness. And, man, USC is just not a tough football team right now. You get fired. 
You know, hey, you yeah. look at you look at Dan Mullen. I mean, Dan Mullen's like, look, man, if, if he did what he did at Mississippi State, exactly. now you're giving him much better pieces yeah, to yeah. work with. Uh, it's no different than Tom Herman. Like you saw what he did and, and turned that thing around at Houston, and now it's like, well, you know, if, if he's if he wants to have tough physical practices, well, when you get it rolling and recruiting like you should at Texas, yeah, you can have those practices because if you lose somebody, if you lose a starter you know, on the offensive line to an injury in practice, well, you know, this our our, our number six guy has been chomping at the bit to play, and he's probably just as good or better than any of the five we've got starting right now. So just yeah. roll him in and, and roll with it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, you're you're right. I mean, it, it, it with Tom Herman. I mean, we all saw what he did at U of H, and the thought process was, oh, man, just add the talent. Like, literally just add hmm. some talent to that to that, uh, that culture, to that philosophy, and boom, you'll have something special. It does seem to be that simple. It's weird, but it does seem to be. It's almost a Mac Brown thing was the same way. Was well, like, but oh, look what he's doing at North Carolina. I look at the 2014 Carolina, OSU team. Basketball school. It goes back to, like, yeah. it goes back to what, you, Texas. Rod, you put it better than, than I could have. If you're a Blue Blood program and you've got the right guy, it shouldn't take you more than a year or two to figure out if you've got the right guy. Yeah. yeah. It, it, well, the Blue Bloods, it turns around pretty quickly. Yeah. It does. Because like, you had yeah. that luckiness that you get talent. Texas, look at our recruiting classes, how hor- or how horrid yeah. the team had been. And Charlie Strong was still bringing in the best classes in the nation. Yeah. Herman, because, yeah, again, it's changed. Texas, man. That's you should get man. players every year. That's the built-in advantage, and that's why when you still hear people, what we saw Saturday for a little tiny window is what you always hear. Well, there's nothing that compares to Texas. It's on its own element because if you can get the players and get the environment and get all these things, you can see what the upside can be. It's just – pretty crazy to see that it had lulled away for about a decade rod well, you, yeah. you like you like bringing up the chris rock example like you don't get credit for things you're supposed to do you're like oh you had a top 10 recruiting out. class at texas great that, that's what you're supposed to do it ain't yeah. hard to recruit at texas man yeah nope. it's like saying it's hard to pull women in a nice car like it's easy <laughs> <laughs> just roll up in the car <laughs> you ain't really got to say that just roll up in the nice car and get out and walk and look yeah and they'll come to you like, so you know, you know, we're at texas <laughs> We're talking about Charlie yeah, Strong, and that's no better segue than to talk about this game for Texas. Returning to the scene of the crime, man. Uh, you <laughs> guys, up, man, this is a scary game for me. I, I'm a little scared. I'm you guys lie. had the luxury to watch that game two years ago on TV. Scary, man. I was there, man. I was there. That's, yeah. and it was real. That was, was a nightmare. Was like that was that was the thing of my uh, memory uh, goes back. Like I remember it being cold <laughs> in my house, and it was a dark evening, oh, and man. you see, uh, I forgot what well, wide receivers on the ground in the end zone, and Mena who's freaking out at the I'll end of the forget, game. Never forget, man. That, that was a horrible that, day. That, you know, walking off the field, and coaches' wives are crying, and. Wow. Going into that post game press conference, and That's the sad. distance from me to Charlie Strong is the distance from me to Matt right now, and. You don't want to make eye contact with him. Like, it's Mm-mm. that awkward. Because, like, he, he knows you know, at that point. Everybody you know. knows. That's why the wives are crying. They know. And, like, and I think. Got to kick my kids out of school. The look you explained for- looked like what he looked like so when they I lost at Iowa State, I, too. I forget I forget how he how the question was phrased, but Mike Finger asked Charlie Strong the question. Mm. And it wasn't even like, it's like, Charlie, what do you think about the future? Or something like that. And it's like, because you had to ask it, but it's like, I mean. You look know, at his face. Yeah. Look at you! Just see, you look he at that. To, to quote dead. Charlie Wise, did you look at that pile of crap out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to quote no, yeah, that's, another kid. That's, that's, that's what it's just. Rod, did you look at that pile of crap out there? Rod, here's yeah. here's why you're right in being nervous about this game. I'm nervous, man. It has lie. nothing to do with this Texas team. It has nothing to do with anything Kansas has. It has nothing to do even with David Beatty coaching his last game. It has nothing to do with Puka Williams rushing for a thousand yards or whatever he had against Oklahoma on Saturday. Mm-hmm. It Senior is the night, fact. Yeah. That you are playing an eleven o'clock game in Lawrence, Kansas, Kansas. on Thanksgiving weekend, which there will be nobody's, no students there. Gonna be there man. Probably gonna have fifteen thousand people there. Like playing a parking lot. Yeah, there's gonna be weird stadium. No juice, no energy. Nothing. Is, is, Even is though Lawrence like uh, Ames is in the middle of nowhere. No, 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 no. Lawrence in. is like Lawrence is like thirty minutes outside of Kansas City. Right, that's like, at it's least not, a little bit. Yeah, it's, it isn't out in the see, middle. They still see some type of other humans in the cornfield yeah. in an empty some, stadium. Yeah, it's it's not like Manhattan. Like Manhattan is out yeah. in the freaking it's middle of nowhere. Field, yeah, yeah. Uh, right off the Flint Hills. But man, there wouldn't be anybody at the game. No, there's no juice. Yeah, it's supposed to be like in the mid forties and rainy. May not even. Oh, that's even worse. No sunshine. And then you yeah, have Les Miles show up on the sideline. No, I'm telling it's going to be a weird. I agree. That's their biggest home field advantage. Is that it's a it's 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 boring and it's a lifeless. 
And you don't atmosphere. respect the opponent. Let's be honest. You don't respect the opponent. It's you Kansas. Can try. You can try, but it's hard. <laughs> you can hard. try. You can try. No, I'd you're like to poll in, but ultimately, you you're yeah, you're not going to be as up for Kansas as you will be for Oklahoma or something. But hopefully, they understand what's at stake. I think and that's that, the big thing with this. That's team. why I agree with you about the atmosphere. It can lull you to sleep, and obviously, it happened versus Texas. It almost happened in. That Mac Brown regime, remember late yeah. Mac Brown? Don't remind me, man. 2012, man. Yeah, it almost you were there, Rod. Too. Yeah, Jeff I remember. Was like, that was so, like 21, but 13. It, but it was nobody there. It was, you know, what I mean, that's why guys were trying to wear like they were trying to come out shirtless because it was cold and mm-hmm. psych themselves up for the game. No, it is what it is. It's Kansas. Ooh, but I think that they, this group, we've seen a lot of maturity from this group. It's what we love about them, right? They beat K State on the road. They've done a lot of things, like winning when your starting quarterback goes down. They've shown winning on senior night, something they hadn't done. I mean, they were 1-7, in seven, I think, in their previous eight senior nights. I think they're mature enough to go there and understand we got to take care of business. It ain't got to be pretty. It ain't got to be, you know what I mean? We ain't got to win, uh, you know, the the, the, the bikini contest. Style with points it. don't matter. Yeah. It, we just got to go out there and win the damn game. We got to go beat yeah. Kansas. Just I'll, that simple. I'll tell you why. I think, I think they can do that. I'll tell you the best sign of maturity – for, for this team and why Texas fans should feel good about this. Before, and if you weren't in the stadium, you don't really realize that this happened. So before the game during pregame, uh, the end of the Oklahoma State-West Virginia game was being shown on the big screen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're watching the press box, but it's kind of going in and out. But it, it, it it's on for like the, la- the very end of regulation. Yeah. And as soon as the ball goes incomplete and they're storming the field in Stillwater, like you saw Texas players like celebrating. Like... Because at that point, some of those guys knew, like, well, our destiny's back in our hands. Like, yeah. we control it. And I remember Brecken Hager, like, throws his hands up in the air. And I see Charles Amena who go grab him and say something to him. And it wasn't like, hey, why don't you walk back over here? It was like a stern a stern look yeah, on his face. Get your mind right. And I asked Charles after the game, I said, you know, what did you say to Brecken? He said, I told him to stop celebrating because that didn't matter. And his exact quote was, what happened in Stillwater is not going to help us beat Iowa State. Hmm. You got. We got a task at hand. We got to deal with this. Yeah. And for your team leaders, and for Tom Herman, and Rod, the one thing I immediately thought of, I thought about you guys in 2001 in Texas Stadium when you guys find out right before the Colorado game, yeah. hey, Tennessee beat Florida. You win this game, you're going to Pasadena to play Miami. Yeah. And but Tom Herman didn't have the decision Mac Brown had, where it's like, hmm. do you tell him? Do you not tell him? It's okay. They saw it. Yeah. They know. Yeah. Now you got to deal with it. The new era, the new era of uh, entertainment, the entertainment yeah. ecosystem. It's, it's got to happen. You know psychologically, I mean? yeah. it's like these kids you are used to You can't pretend like, well, you know, you didn't see that. No, so everybody saw it. Twitter and social media, I mean, we know the okay, cool, hook them. Everybody knows what's behind, yeah. what's behind that, and you can't hide that from the kids. No. Like, they yeah. know. It's like, yeah, I mean, you got kids now. You guys, you got kids. I mean, you got kids. You can't. You can hide stuff from them for a certain amount of time until they get to a certain yeah, age. They get to a certain out. age, they'll start figuring out. Oh, Daddy likes to smoke this stuff that stinks. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, <laughs> and he does it all the time. I yeah. know what that is. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like they'll figure it out. You can't hide that stuff from the kids. So I agree with you, Tom Herman. I think is doing a masterful job of managing like the distractions. Um, on and off the field with the team, I think that's keeping them focused. One and zero, right? He's always said we just trying to go one and zero. And I talk almost Belichickian. We trying to go one and zero. You know, you talk to some of the players after the game, and you know uh, about you know how that unfolded at the end of the Oklahoma State game. And Andrew Beck said he was trying not to watch it, but then he said, "I hear the student section start going nuts, so you have to turn around and see around, why man. they're yelling." Yeah. And then I asked Patrick Vahey, he was like, "You know, I know you know Coach preaches one and zero, but I mean it's on the big screen, like you you <laughs> can't not see it, you know." Yeah. So, but that's a hell of a job by your coaching staff and your veteran leadership to say, look, the impact of that game, it doesn't mean anything if you don't win this game right now. Yeah, I wonder if you went to the locker room and said anything. Herman? Yeah. He did, yeah. About it. Yeah, Okay. and that's pretty much what he told the team. He said, uh, you know, if you don't win this game, what happened up there doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, what happens after this doesn't matter if you don't win this game. No, I get it. I, I mean, I, I think he's done a, a, a great job of keeping the team focused. You know what I mean? Don't worry about the outside distractions. And that includes even going back to Maryland. Give him props after that, too. And, and I don't – man, I just – I can't see this team 
having a, a major letdown to where this game is close in the second half against Kansas because Rod, mm-hmm. they they. But I think this is a team that they realizes there uh, exactly there there are no close. there are no more there are no more hypotheticals. This is an air raid. This this root this air, this offense has air raid roots too. It has air raid roots, but we'll break it down. Texas it ain't, it ain't is a, an air right raid now. Offense. I know it ain't, but they got a, they got but, a running back they can run. But I think this team Before realizes forty on Oklahoma. I think you've got enough veterans on this team that they realize there are no more hypotheticals. This is the situation. You win this game, you're playing for the Big 12 championship. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I'm just saying, you got, I agree with Matt. You got to find close because, uh, yeah, I mean, like it could be within 10 points in the second half. Easily. Because right now the betting line is you know 15. I mean? like, that's, that's close to me. Well, Hell, I mean, Sam Elgin really doesn't know his health. He doesn't have a week to recover. Hell, Sam Elgin yeah. may not make it through the whole game. And and let's, Matt, go ahead. And what's what's the line? What's the line uh, right now? Texas is a fifteen point favorite. It looks like uh, you know I mean? some books that opened at fifteen and a half and has went down to fifteen. So I mean, you could easily see Texas covering yeah. by scoring a late touchdown late to t- make exactly. it thirty eight twenty one. But that means it's thirty one twenty one going into that. Or if Texas even doesn't cover and you get a late yeah. touchdown, you win thirty five twenty four. But that means it was twenty eight twenty four before you get that, and yeah. you still Remember, win by. Double said the offense is not meant to blow people it's out. Not. Like it's not that kind of an offense. And on the road, this team has not came close to performing offensively like you'd expect. And they'll, and they'll have ball control, too, because they will try to run. Their best players, right. they're running back. So let's talk about the Texas offense and, and that situation. And the Sam Ellinger injury, from what Tom Herman said and from we, what we've heard to this point, it sounds like it's not as severe. It's not a really good word to put not on. As but much it's not as much. Yeah, it's, not, yeah. it's a different injury than the first injury. That said, you've got a short week, and you know it's going to be a tough decision for Tom Herman to, in terms of, okay, do you roll Sam Ellinger out there if he's not 100% and what percentage is he in? I guess the thing you really have to ask, Rod, is is this an injury that can get worse if he yeah. plays? Well, in theory, we, we, when you're talking about these joints, and inflammation, just a road game flying to it. If you think back to the last one, you had a full week to heal. And then you had at home, you know, coming in, there was a Baylor game, and then you go up to Oklahoma State. This one, you're going on the road again on in one week. less day, yeah. and then add in a plane flight, which everybody knows nowadays medically it's just been proven it's gonna be cold. that it's going to negate about a day of healing when you go up into that pressurized chamber and the inflammation gets re-inflamed. And being before he had an SC joint thing, that's a pain threshold thing, and inflammation causes pain. pain. So yeah. it's just going to come down to how pain – and th- that's just the unpredictable right. nature of these type of injuries uh and it's going to be cold too which also impacts not, joint yeah, injuries. Yep. Help the situation so am i crazy thinking that texas can win this game and cover with shane bouchelle at quarterback uh not well uh, that's a good question um yeah no no you're not crazy no not at all no they can cover they i can. wouldn't bet it for them too it's not gonna be yeah i agree it's not gonna well I wouldn't bet on it, yeah, if Shane's going to start. I yeah, if you that. put your money on it, then yeah. I'd be like, but yeah, it'd be close. I, I went by 14. I am confident Texas could win with Shane Bouchel if he ends up mm-hmm. starting this game or have to finish this game. No question. I like the fact that now you're at the I've point. seen it already. I've seen right. it and multiple I think, times. And I think the difference between the Baylor game and the Iowa State game, I think Shane Bouchel knew going into the locker room at halftime, okay, I need to get my mind right because I'm probably starting the second half. Yeah. Okay. And I think there was no, well, you rush him on the field and does he need to knock the rust off? It's the first time he's played all year. Eh, There was no rust. I think he knew, they knew the plan, and he goes 10 for 10 in the second half, 89 yards and a touchdown. So I think if you just get Shane Bouchel ready, I, and again, like you said, Rod, sure they're been, doing obviously this week. I've been pointed out all year. This offense isn't made to blow people out. It's meant to really manage a game, control based game. on what you need. Yeah. The what what the game requires. How they the can game flow is the other phases exactly. of the game. Yeah. So I mean, and, and I'm, you're, you're going to have a healthier Colin Johnson than the Colin Johnson we saw on Saturday. Sure. Which by it's almost like. They got Colin Johnson in to do what he needed to do on the first drive, and it's like, all right, just kind of sprinkle him in after that. Well, they needed. they just needed to uh, prove to Iowa State that he can still be a threat. Don't you just put him in man coverage with some scrub and forget about it. Yeah. You better at least put that guy seven, eight yards <sighs> which off they of did. him. they did. Which they did. So it was yeah, – they did exactly what they needed to do because that's what that was the thing. Like, man, is Colin Johnson even 60%? They may not even devote any resources they had, to like their hybrid, like their star position, like their hybrid safety linebacker. They had that guy, Colin Johnson, one-on-one. Yeah, and it was like, nah, we gonna, nah we'll still burn you with him. Yeah. Even at 75, he's still pretty damn good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you'll have a healthier Colin Johnson on offense. You got Keontae Ingram and Trey Watson both fighting through hip injuries. And you got uh, but Rod, the way this offensive line is playing, and I, I go back to that ninety-four yard drive in the Iowa State game. Like this offensive line, it's not a great offensive line, but no, they're at the effective. point right now where you can say, yeah, they're average. 
and average, you can't even quantify how much better that is than what we saw last year, which was brutally abysmal. Like whatever, <laughs> it was like the flaming landfill of offensive lines. It was awful. Yep, and you look at this year, all the way across the board, you're up in the top half if you look at some of the offensive line stats from opportunity rate to uh, stuff rate, 54 and 46, to on standard downs and preventing sacks, and then line yards per carry, you're actually 27th and 35, so that's real good. And even on passing situations, you know, pass sack rate isn't bad. So, you know, when you're in the top 60 across the board, that's that top half, and that's all we've been asking for, especially right. when it was so deficient coming Just in. Just don't in be the terrible. Yeah. Yes. Don't be terrible. And that's a big part about the defense and what's being fixed with the defense is not just one glaring you know, miscommunication issue that negates, say, two drives, you get a field goal, one bad pl- busted play, the opponent gets a touchdown, they've outscored you despite you maybe outperforming the last 20 plays, they get one to negate you. So if you can just get the most out of your offense and then limit them, should be set up good because Texas has been performing pretty well in conference play. And I like the fact that those pieces up front, they just they keep getting better. Like, yeah. we see Zach Shackelford is noticeably getting better. Yeah. Sam Cosme is getting better. Elijah Rodriguez is getting better. So, I like what you're getting out of the offensive line right now. I, I think you're good enough to, to move the ball on Kansas. But to me, Rod, this comes down to the Texas defense against the Kansas offense. Did you find whatever stat nugget you were looking for there, Rod? Yeah, I did. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> since it you was, spent so much it. time and it effort. It wasn't worth it, actually, either. No, no. Okay. <laughs> I just like Rod stop was thinking about it. Was, I was like, I know what's in here. Okay, basically uh-huh. what the stat was, remember yesterday we were talking on the show about this offensive line. I, I think this offensive line is better than the 0-9 line. I think it is. Yeah, I agree. Line. Um, and we were debating whether – it was better than the 2013. Was it 2013? 2013, yes. That, and, and I looked up the guys that were on that line, and you're right. That, that that offensive line had a lot of NFL guys. I don't know if it was uh, as schematically sound as this line is. Like I think this line has as more like schematically. I like it better in terms of the technique that's taught. But mm-hmm. they had Trey Hopkins, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Cedric Flowers was Desmond Harrison like a. Back up on that line? Yes, he was. Yep. He's, he's, a start, he's a starting left tackle in the league now for the Browns. Yes. Mm-hmm. Not, no, yeah, obviously. Been uh, then for a Jeff while. Swain. I forgot about Jeff Swain. Yes, Jeff Swain was a big part of that. one of the best blocking tight ends yeah. in the Trey league. Trey Hopkins was also part of that line. Yeah, as I say, yeah they, had they, two, had, they had Trey Hopkins, Cedric Flowers, Desmond Harrison. Two 40-game starters Jeff with Swain. Mason Walters and Dom so Espinosa. I'm going to yeah. agree with you. That offensive line it was better. Now I'm looking back at the talent. So I was yeah. getting the stats. That you. line was a better run block. Like, that line was – the best run blocking offensive line we've seen they in Texas only, since the 05. They only allowed 06. 16 sacks, I think. Too. That's impressive. Yeah, they only allowed 16 yeah, sacks. Yeah, but keep in mind, once once David Ash got hurt and they went to Case McCoy, they weren't throwing the ball all that much. That's like true, they really sacks they, super damn good. They, they leaned on Jonathan Gray and Malcolm Brown a lot. And then when Jonathan Gray went down, Malcolm Brown basically got his carries. Like Malcolm Brown had in something case, like two over, it was well over 200 carries. What's that this? Year. Uh, what would the sack total at now? Like 13 that Texas has allowed? It's like 13. Uh, you got that up. number handy, like man. 13 or 14 or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to pull it up real quick. the stats right here. Uh, my point being, like, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think that line was better but this o-line probably the best o-line texas had you know we got to go back close to 10 years this is a I'm more second best this is a yeah. more complete group i think than that 2013 group it's a better it has a higher floor that's yeah a better way of saying like it doesn't the drop off i think yeah you know what i mean i agree with you on that 25 yeah. i don't know if the ceiling is i'm high. gonna make a, i'm gonna miss like totally butcher the expression but the the whole is better than the sum of the parts with oh, this yeah, offensive yeah, no. line you didn't butcher that Okay. Yeah, and 25 <laughs> sacks allowed Glad for 175. But when you have a guy like Ellinger, 25 sacks it, so far? yeah, but it oh, can okay. be. I mean, when you have yeah. a running quarterback tackled behind the oh, line of scrimmage, there can be a stat keeper that errs okay. on a lot more sack sides. So that and, isn't and there, as accurate. There's been more than a couple of those. That, Case McCoy wouldn't be afraid to wing a ball if he was under pressure. He was getting rid of it back in the day. That could help those. There's sacks. there's been a couple of those sacks too that Sam's taken that he probably, didn't probably need to. shouldn't have thrown the ball away. Yeah, yeah, like. Handful, yeah, such as life with a sophomore hey, a quarterback sophomore, sometimes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, but he's played really good for uh, considering he's a true sophomore. And amazing, but Rod, I think this comes down to how the Texas defense defends Kansas offense. And you talk about, yeah, it's got air raid roots, it's got but, some air raid, but it doesn't have the, any personnel that's mm-hmm. dynamic enough to Peyton execute. Bender is not a very good quarterback. No, Out, outside of Steve, Steven Sims, there's nothing at the skill positions on the perimeter that worries you at no. all. They'll um, throw in like I think they'll play some those some trick plays though. They since the guys are maybe the last time yeah. Beatty's there, or not maybe. It is the last time yeah. he's gonna be there. He's like, I don't give a damn. We're gonna get wild and crazy. And why not? Just so we can beat Texas again. So I think you're gonna get a ton of random trick plays. When I say a ton, I mean four maybe. <laughs> um <laughs> that's a lot. 
I, a lot. Right? I really think the game plan, Rod, for Todd Orlando, devote upwards of eight bodies to the run. Stop that run. Yeah. You should be if you can't cover them man to man on the outside, then, then hell, it don't matter. You're not gonna yeah. win the Big Twelve title anyway. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yep. Yeah, you got yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't stop them. What it's happening against Hogerson and Riley? You know, but they they scored forty on Oklahoma. But Oklahoma is defense is just atrocious. Like it is, it's really really bad. So I agree with you. I think you just you shut the run down on them, and then you make uh, Bender Peyton beat you. Bender. Make Bender beat you. If Bender beat you. Then yeah, then go with God. You're in trouble anyway. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Make that guy beat you. Just no, and then you know what? I think that that's what they did versus Purdy in a sense. So yeah, I think they'll do the same thing. I agree with you. Yeah, because that running back I heard is a real deal. Puka Williams is yeah. Puka. He's, he's a true freshman. He's gonna be a freshman All American. Yeah, yep. seven yards true per carry. Fresh. Where's he from? Louisiana. Ah, uh, Louisiana. Yeah, that's swamp people. Yeah, mm-hmm. you start looking down at, at swamp K- people. You look at Kansas's roster, and this is something Les Miles is gonna have to do. Uh, when you start looking at okay, do you retain anybody on staff? Oh, uh, Tony Holmes, one of their assistant coaches, who's from who's got Louisiana roots, and and you start looking yeah. at some of Kansas' best players, who like the guys were that were highly touted recruits on that roster. All guys whole recruited, all guys from Louisiana. Yeah, okay, no, no. no. In terms of per capita, Louisiana's always in the top. Like Puka four, Williams, five, Mike Lee, they, Corian Harris, like all those guys are all Louisiana guys. Um, I think, man, I'm a, I'm intrigued by Clint Bowen. I know we talked about David Beatty going to you know being friends with Tom Herman. He and Tom Herman are very staff. good friends. Yeah, yes. uh, and potentially he could end up being addition to the staff. I like Clint Bowen, dude. Like okay, I wanted to have this discussion. I'm glad we got time. Uh, well, we got to get deep oh. into it, but I, I, he's, a, I think he's, got a, he's got the right philosophy about the Big 12, just forcing turnovers, and he does it with Kansas talent, for God's sake. I was talking, they're, Kev, leading the, they're leading the Big no. 12 right now in takeaways and in turnover margin. I'm glad, and I'm glad you brought that up, because Kevin Flaherty, who's our national basketball writer at 24-7 Sports, uh, is – the foremost KU football historian you'll meet. Kevin's a KU grad and, oh, and loves really? loves KU football. Nice. So we're talking about we're <laughs> talking random. about Bowen and and I, I brought up the idea of you know hey, Bowen's been in that KU bubble for like he he went to Lawrence High School like yeah, he's been in that KU there, bubble yeah. for a long time. Right. And I said, you know, it's probably not a bad idea as long as he's been in this league for Todd Orlando to bring him in as a defensive analyst yeah. and just kind of pick his brain about the league. And, you know, he doesn't have to worry about recruiting. It's just, hey, help Watch. us with schemes Man. and, and, and help, us, help us against this league. Teams, help yeah. us break this down. I so agree. we started talking about Clint Bowen, and I didn't realize Bowen had been a coach at Kansas so long. And do you know who he learned defense from, Rod, when he was the defensive coordinator at Kansas back yeah. in the day? Bill Young. When Bill oh, Young Oklahoma was State the back DC in the day. at uh, Kansas, oh, I didn't know Bill Young was even at Kansas. Yeah, under Mangino, Man, and oh, we oh was that back then the uh, Akib Talib days? Akib Talib yep. and Chris Harris, wow. yes. And we've talked about Damn, Bill that. Young kind of being, yeah, really implementing the the modern plan that all Big Twelve defenses should live by. The cheat code, mm-hmm. baby, and it's forced turnovers. And yeah, Clint Bowen learned a lot of his defense from Bill Young, and Bill Young's philosophy, Great. it's not all that different from Todd Orlando. It's not. It's you can throw for as many yards on me as you want. You're not going to run the ball down my throat. You will be one-dimensional. Yes. And then when you're one-dimensional throwing the ball, that's when I can break out all my toys Yes. and all my exotic blitzes. And that's yeah. and Clint Bowen's kind of an extension of Bill Young. And what did Bill Young do at Oklahoma State? Worst what did he decide? You know what? It, it's about possessions and turnovers. Yep. My team's going to score. So yeah. I'm just going to be I'm gonna 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 roll the, the dice. We're going to gamble. We're going to go for the interception because yeah. we're just going to try to limit your possessions. And get them one or two extra possessions. I do that, we win. And if y'all score, oh, well, well offense is yeah. back, and they'll so, get it back real quick, and he, I'll do it all over again. And he's doing that at Kansas, but as you went out, they don't have the, the, the complementary offense that they can – those added possessions that they're getting with takeaways can help the team win games because they can't score any damn points really. But that defense, they're forcing turnovers guys with Kansas talent. They're yeah. leading the Big 12 in takeaways, leading the Big 12 in turnover margin, and it ain't even close, by the way. Texas is second yeah. in turnover margin. It ain't even close. No, no and it, I agree with you. It's insane. It's insane. That it's plus 15 now. It doesn't now. make any sense. It, well, exactly, and that's what it's going to prove. Turnover no, luck. No, 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 yeah. but you go back and look at it the last three or four years, though, Kansas is always pretty high in forcing turnovers. Other, man, other than, la- oh, other than last year, yeah, they're pretty like, high. you go back to Bill yeah. Young's time at Kansas and you look at what Bowen's done, they're always they're always pretty near high. the top of the league and near the top of the league in takeaways. Like, well, no, and there? you and you always I mean going back to like Charles Gordon, like you've always seen like a, how like how's this guy from Kansas like first or second in the league in interceptions? Yep, and like they've always got a guy that's top yep, top or, two or three or in the league in picks with Dorrance Armstrong. They got a guy. Yeah. They keep a little pass rusher. No, I'm with you. Like they 
they always have like one or two pieces, and they get maximized there. So if I'm and we're like we're not saying Kansas plays great defense all the time, but but the modern era of the Big Twelve. So if I'm Tom Herman and Todd Orlando, I I try to get Clint Bowen on my staff as a defensive analyst, and just even just for a year, just pick his brain and just see like, hey, look, you've been in that Kansas ball for a long time. Why don't you come down to Austin? Austin You don't have to recruit. You don't have to do anything. We don't even need you on the field coaching. We just want you in the film room. I just want to pick your brain and 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 let's work on how research and development. Yeah, exactly. The uh, and I, I'll be quick about this. I know we're running out of time. The best offense in the NFL is New Orleans Saints. They have, you know, the head of their research and development is Sean Payton. Yeah. He brags about it. Hmm. He says every week I go out of my way. I watch film on all the teams that I really like. I watch film on Sean McVay. I watch film every week on Josh McDaniels. I watch film every week on the best offenses out there. And I think he goes to the college game too. He, oh, yeah. didn't re- he didn't reveal that. My point being, everybody's got to have research and development teams now, and not just one or two guys. No, you need a whole department. You need a sector. Yeah. That's just researching. Like Bama has hired all those guys. Watching, exactly. Just watching the best offense in the country and going, I right, steal that play, steal that play, steal that play. Let's take it. Let's go. And that was my you know favorite I mean? quote I heard and from Ed Orgeron. He was crediting my analysts, his analysts, yeah, for the main that's guys. That's what your analysts are supposed to be doing now. Not, not only examining the saber metrics and the analytics. No, no. But I need you also, I need you guys to watch football, that know football, and just steal plays. Because it is truly a copycat league, literally and figuratively. Steal plays from other people. And I'm, I'm sure Texas has a you know a copycat staff too. That's how the Philly special gets around the way it does, and everybody yep. starts running. And then deep. now everybody's looking. And now for everybody's it. got that in their playbook. Dude, research and development, R and D, baby. Clint Bowen. I do like head of R and D. When you when you look at at the defense, <laughs> getting back to Bowen, when you look at the defensive staff, you know you go back to last season, and one of these guys is still on the staff. But you look at who Todd Orlando, like his quality control guys are, like who his analysts are. One is Roosevelt Majit, who played at Iowa State, so he's been around the league for a long time, mm-hmm. played and I believe was a GA at Iowa State. And he also brought in Trey Haverty, who played at Texas Tech, oh, yeah. had been on Gary Patterson's staff at TCU, yeah. had been on Cliff Kingsbury's staff at Texas Tech. So Trey Haverty had been around the Big 12 for a long time. So Todd Orlando really got two guys that understood the league and could help him say, yeah, this is these guys' tendencies, this is some stuff that's worked. And it's just it's just talking ball, Rob. That's really Sorry, what you're doing. Is Haverty an offensive guy? Uh, Haverty's a defensive guy, and Haverty is actually uh, on Sonny Dykes' staff at SMU now. As a defensive, as like a legit, uh, I think he's their defensive good? coordinator. Actually, okay. Right. Um, okay, that's pretty. Cool. If he's not, he's an assistant coach. I know that yeah. much. But Trey Haverty had been again in a war room with Gary Patterson. He's been around the league a long time. I just think the more guys you can get that un- around you that under specifically defensively that understand the league, the better off you're going to be. I agree. Amen. So. The stakes are real simple in Lawrence, gentlemen. Winning your end. Texas wins this game. And they're playing either Oklahoma or West Virginia for the belt at AT&T Stadium. I think, you know, I said this, you know, instead of – because you can't give out the golden hat twice. Like, Texas has the golden hat, and they've got it for a year, and they should. But if it's Texas and Oklahoma, like, shouldn't you get, like, the Ric Flair big gold belt and give that out to the winner of that game the second cool. time around? The Big 12's not cool enough for that, brother. No, they're not. And actually, <laughs> yeah, it's in there seeing Bowlesby uh, man, talking oh, about Matt, I was going to get through this whole podcast without. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, cool okay, enough. so if you haven't seen it, Brecken Hager said what oh, Texas yeah. people say about Oklahoma. He said, oh, OU sucks, and OU has no defense, and said that after. It's 11-12, and OU still yeah, sucks. Yeah, said that Just after the Texas Iowa State joke. Game. And Thanks. now, you know what? Bob Bowlesby sucks. The Big 12, yeah, that's always the Big 12 said Brecken Hager violated their sportsmanship agreement by disparaging another team. And as as per the terms of – the reprimand, because apparently this is the second time he's done this. I guess, I guess the first time was maybe the Oklahoma State game. I have no idea. They didn't say what the first offense was. But this, on the second offense, you have to issue a public apology for your public reprimand. Yeah. You know what I hope it's happened, most- what I sincerely yes. hope happened? I hope that whoever, you know, in the Sports Information Office at Texas helped Brecken Hager type that thing out and send mm-hmm. it out and said, are you good? Yeah, we're good. I hope Brecken made them print that out. He went to the printer. He got his formal public apology and went to the bathroom and wiped with it because that's what I think of the Big 12 public <laughs> reprimand of Brecken Hager. Like, this is a league, Rod, that t- that publicly upholds. We have the toughest path to the college football playoff. 
It's not something you should be proud of. Yeah. It's only the toughest path because you made it the toughest path yeah. by yeah. adding a conference championship game. What about your terrible officiating that everybody thinks is a Very joke true. Now? Yeah, how about you improve on that? Make that a priority. Yeah. How about you send a public <laughs> apology out to all these teams for the crappy officiating? Yeah. These yeah, formal about, public got, apologies that are forced that don't mean anything, and it's yeah. like, we're going to reprimand you, you, and now you have to print this out. It's just yeah. hilarious. What about it's the absurd. fact that you are, everybody believes that you are uh, a, a conference that is destined to implode in the hmm. near future. The right? Michael Scott of Big 12 commissioners. Baylor is still gone without consequences for the Baylor sexual assault scandal. Or, or, but there are bigger issues to worry about than Brecken Hager and, and him saying that OU suck. That's the Kansas basketball about. program has been implicated in a probe by the FBI. Yeah, saying, they're bigger fish for you to fry, brother. The federal freaking government. Yeah, yes, but the thing is, is he only cares about the image of his job. conference so and the me, power. That tells me Bob Bowlesby, and if he has, he hasn't paid attention when he's been at the Texas OU game. That tells me he's never been there. Because there ain't much sportsman like on, the, on that day at the Cotton Bowl if you've ever been there. Well, see, that's the thing. He doesn't care about it, actually. He only cares about what the image is, so then he can go and get an apology to come from the situation. He doesn't actually care about all those things. It's just how his conference shines luck upon him, and it's just corporate America bleeding into your football game, which is BS. No, it's stupidity. There you go. It Agreed. Is. It's, the big, it's the Big 12. There you go. <laughs> Gosh. All right. So thanks for bringing that up, Matt. Yeah. Um, Bowlesby sucks. So Brecken Hager, mm-hmm. fresh off of a public reprimand from the Big 12. He should have said, okay, cool. Hunk that again, him. I hope he used his toilet paper mm-hmm. when he was done issuing it. Uh, he will be with Texas when the Longhorns go to Lawrence. Win and you're in. Uh, Texas wins. They play the winner of Oklahoma, West Virginia for the Big 12 title. Matt. Yes, sir. What do you think about this Kansas game? Oh, I think it'll be one that might be a little bit uglier than we expect. I See, it's hard to predict, you know, when you don't know about the QB situation. Like, we sort of knew about, like, say, Duffy Bowman. This one, I don't even think we know that much. Like, it's hard to gauge where you're at. And then, since there's so much meaning on this game for the next one, you want a healthy Ellinger, but you don't want to take this for granted and do all the things that you're trying to tell your team not to do and go out there and do. But I got faith in Bouchelle, and I think Bouchelle, even if it is him and I'm expecting it maybe to be mostly Bouchel or a lesser version of Ellinger. We talked about this before. Take away some arm strength, take away some mobility. You basically get Bouchel. So the offense may look quite similar no matter which one's in there. It'll be ugly enough to get the win, but I think Texas will maybe cover. I'm not going to bet on it in something like 31 to 17. Rod B, what say you? Um, yeah, I agree with your theory, though, about the, the lull. Um, the boring atmosphere. It's gonna. It, be it can. Brutal. It can be hard to get yourself energized and get motivated. But they should understand. By the way, Texas. screw the Big Twelve too for making this game the game Texas plays on Thanksgiving weekend on the road in Lawrence. This is also true. Uh, I can't wait till this league gets nuked and Texas can go do something else. I don't <laughs> want the league nuked. They just need more need new leadership. But I digress. Um, Kansas. I do think that. Um, I don't know. Kansas will have a lot of fight in them. I don't know how long that'll last. So I think early on, first quarter, maybe it's closer than Longhorn fans would like. Longhorns pull away. I say they pull away, end up winning 33-2. to. Ooh, am I going to give Texas? How many points am I going to give Kansas the question? I'm That's saying, what I was afraid of. Yeah, 30, I'm going to go 33-17. to 17. Yeah, I'm going right around you, 33-17. to 17. Man, you're spot on. That over-under has been floating around 51 also. Yeah, 33-17. to 17. Yeah, right now it looks like one book 50 and a half, one another book up to 51 and a half. Yeah. Uh, Sounds about right. I will not take Texas to cover, but I do think it's going to be a comfortable win. And keep this in mind. Tom Herman said, you know, there's no karma for, you know, what happened two years ago. It's a different program. And it is. A lot has changed at Texas. Yeah. In the two years since that game happened. But. Especially if Shane Bouchelle starts this game. A lot of shame on that field. <laughs> Shane Bouchelle was a starting quarterback for that game in Lawrence. Yeah. And guys yeah. like Charles Amenahu and Patrick Vahe, mm-hmm. they were there. I think Texas wants this game. I do think Kansas will fight. I do think Kansas will score. I would not be shocked if Kansas goes up 7 nothing in this game. Mm. But W-I-N, Whiskey Indian November, the point of this <laughs> game is win, get it get done, dub, baby. get the W, Just go win, to AT&T baby. Stadium, play for the belt. Texas wins 27-14. What's the oh, Whiskey okay, okay. Indian November reference? Uh, that's a little major pain for you. There you go. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. That's awesome. W-I-N. Nonsense. <laughs> All right. Uh, gentlemen, enjoy your Thanksgiving. 
Hey, you, you too, too brother. Senor. Happy I will, Thanksgiving. I will be spending Thanksgiving oh, afternoon and evening uh, oh, in Kansas. Oh, man. So you're God traveling knows. on Turkey Day? Yeah, yeah. I might go to a movie or something. I don't know. Because I'm going to miss, uh, actually, I'm probably going to miss most of the Cowboys Go see game, the Wizard of Oz. So. I'll, I'll figure something out. But, uh, Matt, uh, thanks for everything, man. Oh, you're more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Always, brother. Always a good time. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game who's back with us this week. Thank you very much, Travis. Boom. Good video board operator, too. Oh, <laughs> shout out. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn 1049, 1019 AM 1260. Streaming on the Horn app and at hornfm.com, where you can hear Rod each and every weekday on the Rodcast from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. And thanks to Matt, you can get Longhorn Blitz anywhere you get your podcasts and always get our archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.